Well, good morning to all and particularly to Graham, who is up in the middle of the night on a Sunday morning. So he's imbibed plenty of coffee and he's ready to take us on. Um, this is the first time we've gone west rather than east for speakers. And, uh, you know, we've got to get Australia in there at some point, but New Zealand is the first step. Um, Graham, as some of you may know, is the president, I believe, for the second time of the uh, of the New Zealand Bromeliad Society, and congratulations to him. He is also the assistant editor for the BSI Journal. Uh, and together, he and Andrew Flower, the, the editor, have done a great job in bringing that journal up to speed. Congratulations to all. He's really done a great job there. But apart from those things, he's a man out in the garden, out in the wilds, growing and He'll tell you about what he's doing in, in, the, in the bush. Now, what he calls bush is different from what Australians call bush. And it's different from what <laughs> we Californians call bush and it, or, or, or chaparral. It's different from what the Europeans call mesquite or the Chileans matarral or the South Africans bean bus. It's different from all these things, but he's going to tell you what it is and how he grows in it. His house is set in the middle of of such a place and I remember seeing it, it was seven or eight years ago when I first went out there and there he was in the middle of this thing. It was a wonderful sight how he had cleared a, an area and found a home for, for millions. It, it's, he really knows what he's doing and I hope we're going to enjoy this. Graham? Yes, thank you, Andrew. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, for that um, introduction. Um, I'm glad you uh, 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 attempted to explain a little bit about, about the bush, or what we call bush here, or native forest. Uh, you can see a little shot of it there in that main photo, which is in the bottom of my garden. Um, so yeah, firstly, uh, thank you for inviting me to, to speak. Um, it is the middle of the night here, but um, it's no problem. I normally get up early anyway. Um, so we're going to get straight into it. My, my talk today is, is basically in three parts. Firstly, I'd just like to show you a little bit about where New Zealand is in the world. Not everybody knows. Um, I know some of you have been here, but um, I'm going to show you where we are, how we, how we grow things down here a little bit um, gen in general terms. And... Um, and um, then we'll move on to uh, what actually grows well for us in our climate, or for me in particular, in my, in my garden. And then I'll finish with some, some techniques for, that I use um, that have been successful for growing bromeliads as epiphytes in the trees, as you can see in that photo there. Um, that's one of the things I like to do is to to grow them naturally as they would in the wild, particularly the Brazilian species and the hardier species that, um, that grow in the trees in the wild. So hope you enjoy it. Um, and I'm sure there'll be some questions at the end. So let's try and move on. There we go. So firstly, um, just a map of the world there and I'll put in some some little markers to show you where we are. As you can see, New Zealand in the bottom right corner is not a part of Australia, like some people believe we are. Uh, we're about 1,200 miles from Australia, and the blue line uh, across the, the screen there is the latitude of Auckland, which is where I live and is the, ma the major uh, area for growing bromeliads in the country. Um, Moving up a line there, you can see the red star, that's Rio de Janeiro in South America. So we are a fair way south of here and also a fair way south of, of the Queensland in Australia, which is the yellow star. And then in the Northern Hemisphere, we have yourself. So you can see that we are a little bit further south in, in the same latitudes as you would be in North in the Northern Hemisphere. We're probably around about the same latitude as Monterey in California. So that gives you an idea of the Monterey, uh, San Francisco area as, as the kind of the climate um, or latitude that we're dealing with. 
so here's a map of New Zealand, um, and this starts the first part of, of, of the talk. Um, here's just some facts and figures. You can see that we're a very temperate climate here, um, ranging between, in, in Fahrenheit terms, that you'd be used to 60 degrees uh, average in summer, up to 75, so not that hot, um, and just a nice, uh, comfortable climate. Um, and in winter time, 44 to 57. So again, it's coolish, um, but we don't get in the northern part of New Zealand anyway in Auckland, which is where the yellow dot is on that map. We don't get extreme winter temperatures. We do have areas where we get frosts, as you'll see a little bit later on, um, but they are generally only in lower lying areas. And I'm lucky where I am that I don't receive any frosts in the lowest temperature I would get down to uh, would be around about six or seven degrees um, being living in the, in the bush, which helps. And our rainfall on the left there, um, I think uh, someone told me is a lot, lot more than you guys are used to. And so this is one of the issues we face, particularly in winter time, uh, when we do get most of our rain, winter, autumn and springtime. And um, it can be a challenge to grow a lot of the plants outside. Uh, so we have to really kind of know our, know our stuff and know what grows well and what doesn't. Um, the red dots on that photo uh, uh, map, sorry, um, uh, give you an idea of where bromeliads are commonly grown in the country. Uh, the blue dots in the South Island, uh, there are locations of botanical gardens where there are some bromeliads such as puyas and some dickias and a, a few very, very hardy species such as maybe Echnia recovata and, and uh, things like that that grow outside down there. But in the South Island, um, they can get snow and um, frosts very regularly in wintertime. So bromeliads don't generally do that well outside down there. Um, there is a couple of our members in Christchurch, which is this area. Um, can you actually see my my mouse pointer or not? Yeah. Yes. You can. Okay, thanks. Um, so this is Christchurch here, and there are some gardens that have some bromeliads growing outside. But as you can see in the main, most of the bromeliad uh, cultivation takes part in this in this northern quarter of the country here where the temperatures um, in, in winter are much milder and um, the, also the daylight is um, during winter times is, is much longer. The green dots are the locations of our bromeliad groups that we have around the country. So we have uh, six or seven and there's also a Talancia group in Wellington here. Um, so they're the, our, the, the regional groups that uh, have their own membership but uh, generally most people are all members of the Bromeliad Society of New Zealand. So that just gives you an idea of where we are and what we do. So just to start off with some, some of the, the things that we do well here. Um, the the right-hand photo is a shot of my, what I call my hybrid garden. Um, and I'll explain a bit later on about what I do with hybrids and species, but and the left hand shot is a, another one of our members um, lovely gardens um, over in the other, other side of Auckland. You can see there the purpose of this photos is to show that we can grow things like breezes and large neos and um, most bromeliads in the garden in, in near full sun all year round. We don't get um, excessive burning and bleaching. It does happen uh, in the very middle of summer, in the middle of the day. Um, but if you have some kind of tree cover or palms or things like that, you can quite easily grow bromeliads outside in full sun, which is, I know, a lot different to where you live and, um, and particularly those in, in Australia as well. Here's another example here. Uh, this is the same garden we saw in the previous photo. Um, so all of these are growing in all day full sun. Neo fireballs, you have neo rosy morn, the pink plants down the front. There are Orlandianas in there. There are um, 
lots of Spanish moss and, and other neos. And so this is quite common here when you go around the gardens, if you come to our conference, we'll be actually visiting this garden, which is a, an absolute manicured masterpiece. Um, and um, a lot of our members are very creative in the way they are displaying their plants. Another example here, this one is actually uh, about two and a half, three hours south of Auckland, down in the Bay of Plenty area. And so it's still very sunny and hot down there. And you can see that uh, this member's got, got mini neos and midi neos growing around his pool in, in full sun all year round. Um, the other thing we do very well here is, is grow breezes and, and also breed breezes. Andrew Malloy, um, has, who's, who is now retired and sold his nursery, has bred thousands and thousands of different uh, uh, breezer hybrids over the last probably 25 years. And uh, these are just a couple of examples. And we have virtually every color and size and shape breezer that you can think of here. And um, he's used many of the, the common Brazilian uh, species to make these plants. And so we're very lucky to have, have whatever color and, and, and shape selection that you, that you like really to suit our gardens. Um, so again, if you ever get to visit New Zealand, this is the main, one of the main things you'll see in our collections and our gardens is these beautiful large and small Grigia hybrids growing. There are some issues though, as I said earlier, this is a photo I took in my garden at my previous house, uh, maybe 15 years ago, um, Alcantaria imperialis. And um, this was in the lower lying area of Auckland. And um, this can happen very easily um, overnight in winter time. Um, the plants can just turn to brown paper with a bad frost. And actually the this plant here you see in the center of the photo is actually this plant here two years later. So it's a little bit of a lesson for those of you who do get frosts. Don't throw your um, alcantarias away because if you just look down in the center of this one here, the leaves are not burnt and it will steep, it will, it will actually keep growing. So I moved these plants, cut them back and then moved them to my current property and this is the this is the plant growing in the garden um, a few years ago. This is also common here. Um, we get weaker plants such as this that are lacking in chlorophyll or come from um, warmer areas or more tropical zones. Um, we can't grow them outside very well. We get often get a lot of lower leaf dieback and uh, leaf damage. So again, you really have to know what plants you're putting where and, and, and what conditions they like. Otherwise you can very quickly go backwards. Um, and yeah, basil rot. This is my uh, Guzmania bismarcki, which I grew in my greenhouse for quite a while. And again, you even, you even have to learn about which plants will grow in the greenhouse versus outside. So you have to understand where they come from in habitat, what ele elevation they grow at. And, um, and also what things like things like what water they enjoy and, and, and so forth. So unfortunately, yep, this one um, didn't get near to blooming size and um, ended up dying. So in terms of pests, um, we don't really have too many issues here other than the usual scale and stuff. We don't get any black fly speck scale uh, like you do in the warmer areas, uh, but we do get lots of mealy bug and other scale. And this little critter is probably our, our worst nightmare, or he is for me anyway. Uh, they, they like living in the, in the bush areas around where I live. And um, they're, they're very um, good at sitting in their little homes and watching what you're doing and then coming out at night and eating your favorite plants. As you can see here, he's, he's completely eaten this leaf right off of this palantia and had a nice meal on, on this leaf here. Um, I don't know, I've lost count of how many um, show quality plants that I've been grooming and um, I go out the next day uh, to get them ready for the show and um, the best leaf on the top of the plant seems to be always eaten. So um, yeah, they're, they're endemic to New Zealand, the wetter, there's 
quite a few different species of them and some of them are very rare, but um, they're very common. Um, we don't get grasshoppers or locusts so much, but we do get these guys. So um, this just gives you an idea of, of Auckland, um, where, where I live. You can see GB there, that's, that's the location of my property. Uh, and so I'm on the western, very western edge of the main city. Um, you can see it's a very narrow isthmus there between the Tasman Sea and the Pacific Ocean. In the center here, it's probably only about one kilometer wide between this uh, large Manukau Harbour and the White, White Amata Harbour here. The orange dot is where they just had the recent America's Cup yacht, yachting out on this area here. The red dot is the city center Harbour Bridge area. The blue dot is where we have our monthly um, Society of New Zealand meetings. And the purple dot is the uh, International Airport. The green dot is where we have our, our conferences. Um, our, our Kiwi Broms conference will be there in another year or two. And um, over on the left hand side here is the, is the highest peak in the area, which is the Waitakere National Park. Waitakere Ranges. So there's a large mountain range over to the west here um, before we get to the ocean. So, so I'm living um, just in the start of those foothills of those mountains. And this is what the terrain looks like. So a lot of the area is, is a little bit built out with um, suburban houses. So my house would be is around about in the central strata area here, which is about 120 meters above sea level. So with the, the enveloping bush and the, and the height above sea level, as I said earlier, we don't get frosts and it's, it's quite a good climate to be able to grow uh, bromeliads. Um, some of you from who have been to Brazil will, will notice that it's, it's quite similar looking to some of the, um, the forested uh, Atlantic forest areas there. So about eight, nine years ago, I was lucky to purchase uh, this property and move from the lower lying area um, up to about a half acre property, which is still in, in basically in the middle of suburbia, but I'm completely surrounded by, by native bush in a little valley, which is north facing. So we get good sunlight and um, uh, the property has um, these, uh, native Kanuka and Manuka trees, which grow up to 12, 15 meters tall. Um, so I have a large lawn area and the gardens, as you can see there, were pretty much bare when I got here. There were some um, um, garden beds that were covered in crushed beach shell and also some garden beds down the bottom and up the top, which are covered in river stone, uh, river stone pebbles. So, I had lots of space and I had virtually no gardens apart from a few agapanthus and a few weedy kind of plants to work around. Everything else was native trees. You can see some of these kanukas here are probably 60 to 70 years old and uh, they're a paperback variety of the myrtle family uh, native to New Zealand. Um, there's also some native uh, palms here called nikau palms and we have a lot of cordyline, um, uh, we call cabbage trees as well. So a lot of trees that I was able to think about growing plants and, and um, so I basically moved my collection from my other property, which was a, a couple of thousand plants and um, started to populate the garden. So what I decided to do was split the property into two, um, two different gardens. The lower garden you see here would was going to be completely dedicated to species only. So every plant you see uh, today is photographed um, from this area and are all species, there's no hybrids. Uh, on the other side of the house, uh, there's a large deck and the driveway area and I dedicated that area for hybrids only, mainly New Zealand hybrids, but also a lot of other ones that I like. Um, so you can see here, I've just bought plants from the other place and started to, to populate the gardens and the trees or space them out. You can see um, Talantia somnians growing on the trees here is very common here. 
and goes a lovely red color in full sun. Um, Racinea fraseri growing in a tree up here is, is also another very easy to grow popular plant. I also had two large, the only two trees on the property were two large uh, pin oak trees um, that were shading a lot of the garden and the house. So I decided that they had to go and um, I wanted native trees only. And um, so what I did was I left the stumps um, about four meters above the ground so I could grow uh, bromeliads on them. You can see uh, some Ichnia nudicaulis here and uh, that's uh, Neurogelia curia raujoi sitting on top of that clump. And it's been up there for eight years and in full sun and just uh, does, does brilliantly. So I've covered these trees pretty much in, um, in bromeliads now and uh, they're starting to rot away, but um, uh, thankfully they're still going. Um, I also left the logs that, that came from those trees and put them in heaps below the trees. And um, I've just uh, positioned plants, uh, bare plants sitting on top of the logs. So you can see uh, Neurogelia concentrica and Coria raujoi here. Uh, and also some Echnia fasciata, Whitrockia, and um, uh, Neurogelia McWilliamsi growing there. They are just sitting bare on top of these rogs, logs, and um, within a few weeks, they just put out roots and um, root themselves to the logs. You'll see another photo later on showing that as well. So here's just some shots of the garden to give you an idea of, of how it kind of looks now. Um, uh, you, I'll talk more about mounting these plants later on, but you can see that they're just happily living on the trees. Um, the house has a, has a veranda going right around it, so I'm able to view the garden from, from basically a high level looking down on it, which is nice. Um, and that's just looking down across the Alcantaria garden and uh, to, the, to the bottom there. And this photo shows what we currently, uh, commonly, I should say, uh, get, it's especially around this time of the year, which is our autumn time, and also uh, towards the end of winter. Being in, in a valley in a, in a higher altitude area, we get we get cloud and mist um, moving through the property on a quite a regular basis, which of course is great for the plants um, and is what they're used to in the cloud forests of of uh, the Atlantic forest in Brazil. So this is quite a common sight to look out the window in the morning and see the place enveloped in cloud uh, for a couple of hours until the sun comes up and um, the plants really love it. Just some more shots here, a few Talansias growing in the trees. I'll talk more about them later on, but um, they're all hardier types. Um, we, 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 we can't grow a lot of Talansias outside here because it's too wet in winter. They get too waterlogged, and as we know, Talansias don't like to be waterlogged, particularly at, at night time when it's cold and wet. So um, again, we have to be mindful about which ones we're using. This is Talansia kirchhoffiana up the top here, and some hardier clones of, um, it's Rodriguezziana here, uh, and Secunda, and, and a few other Aranthos and things that are hardy. And on the right-hand side, we have, um, Talansia somnians again, and this is Neurogelia zinata growing up the top here. Just another shot there of uh, a little bit uh, overexposed due to morning sun, but you can see um, this is uh, Brigia elata up here, which is a great plant for growing in trees. Um, flowers for about, when well, bloom and red bloom for about six months. Uh, Brigia mulleri here. Brazilian species, and this is Alcantaria geniculata coming into bloom. Just another shot there of Alcantaria blooming in the gardens. They're very popular here. Um, we have many, many different clones of Imperialis that have been grown from seed over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and I probably have 20 to 25 different species of Alcantaria growing in this garden. I also have a greenhouse, um, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we can't grow everything outside, so I have to uh, grow a lot of the more tender species inside the greenhouse, uh, such as 
Cohen Verges, uh, a lot of Talantias, um, and um, some of the more tropical ecmeres and that get grown in the greenhouse. So I have around about, I had a count up a couple of years ago and it's something like 500 different species and quite a few more different varieties and clones of those across about 45 different genera. Okay, so just moving on to the second part, I'm gonna show you now specifically some of the, the plants that grow very well for us um, in New Zealand. And also uh, most of these you will see um, are growing as epiphytes as they would in the wild. So here we have um, some just some common breezes that you would probably all be familiar with. Um, Breezia guttata here on the right hand side. You can see the old inflorescences and leaves. So this has been growing about three meters up a large tree for um, uh, the last 10 or 12 years here. And um, there's another photo later on that shows you how I mounted it. Uh, flowers every, every, probably every couple of years and um, does very well for us. As does these two breeches, um, which the, are not as common as you would think in some countries. Um, Pyroglyphica can be quite difficult to grow um, in some climates. You have to find the right place for it to grow. Um, and um, it does grow well here in the trees for me, as does the Regia alta dacere. Um, it's a beautiful sword shaped species from Brazil and again has a lovely um, inflorescence. So they are growing about three meters up trees and um, very happily uh, clumping up. The hieroglyphica actually got blown down on a big storm we had. Um, so I've had to reposition some smaller ones now. Um, and here's just a, an example of the different forms that we have here. The plant on the right was one I grew probably 15 years ago and um, got to an enormous size. That, that plant is about one and a half meters in diameter. And if you grow them under another tree, such as a China doll tree, or which this one was growing on, under, they really feed off the flowers and the leaves that fall into them. And they just um, they are a bit like Gasmanias. They're gross feeders being adapted to living in the forests. And um, they will grow quite large, um, with, just with no fertilizer at all, just natural leaf detritus. The plants on the left were grown by one of our members um, about four hours south in the Bay of Plenty. He grew thousands of hieroglyphicas well, probably about 15 to 20 years ago. And he has literally hundreds and hundreds of these um, positioned throughout his um, garden, his farm garden down there, which look amazing. Um, quite a few different uh, forms um, and, and, and patterns on them. Breezer Filippo Cobergii um, is another very popular one here. Um, these, are, these are both growing in trees and, and bloom regularly once they clump up. We're able to get the very, very uh, dark uh, red tips on the plants here, which uh, some clones uh, overseas I've seen don't seem to get. Uh, I think it must be our, our cooler winter temperatures that do that. Um, but that's another very popular and easy to grow plant. Here it is in full sun, um, which looks amazing. And you often see this plant growing in full sun in gardens, which again, you probably wouldn't be able to do um, in your climate in, in San Diego, perhaps. Um, you can see a little bit of leaf tip burning there, but uh, it still looks amazing. And um, our native tui birds love feeding on them. They're nectar feeders. And um, when they flower, they're these, these birds live around my property here in the native bush and um, you commonly see them feeding on the, on the Filippo flowers and also the Alcantaria flowers. This is an interesting uh, plant, um, Breezia gigantea variety Sideliana. Um, this is commonly known or wrongly known as Breezia nova. So if you have a nova, um, you should be naming it this. Um, this, this is a lovely slow growing plant that um, is also quite common here and has been used to make a lot of different hybrids. We saw one earlier actually. Um, but you'll see my right hand picture there. 
this is an earthworm that I found living in the leaf detritus of this plant. Uh, when I went to photograph it a few weeks ago, um, I was kind of cleaning the leaves out to make it look a bit more presentable. And I found this large worm living under all of that stuff in, near the top of the plant. In fact, it was in this leaf uh, right here, about halfway up. So I've never ever seen that before. And you wonder how on earth it would get from the ground up into the, um, the mid ranges of the, of the plant. I don't think a worm, uh, a bird would have been silly enough to drop it there, but um, perhaps they did, who knows. But um, it just uh, shows you that you can be surprised sometimes when, when you're looking around the garden. Um, Another one of my favorites and a very rare plant that some of you may not have seen before, Breezer pastichopiana. This is one of the, the giant breezes uh, of Brazil, um, which um, the Brazilians will know is, is very rare in the wild now and maybe even extinct in some areas. It can grow um, up to well, larger than two meters in diameter and two meters high. This one is currently about one and a half meters. And um, as you can see, it's beautifully patterned leaves and um, it's quite slow growing. I haven't bloomed this yet, but um, I'm really looking forward to it and, and hopefully one day getting a few pups that I can start putting them in other places around the garden. So if you ever see one of these for sale, um, you have the space and you have a shady, cooler area to grow it, um, definitely worthwhile getting. This is what I call Mulford's Garden or my Breezer Fosteriana Garden. Um, I like to grow uh, species of the same clone all together if I can, um, just to enjoy the different forms and colors and shapes of them. So I have around 10 to 12 different clones of um, Fosteriana that I've collected over the years. Um, the one in the center here is, is they have a cultivar name called Golden Legend, which came from uh, Fosteriana rubriform seedlings um, in New Zealand many years ago. And this plant on the right here is a very interesting one. It's, it's the common the greener form of Fosteriana. And this was actually, this actual plant you see in the photo, which I photographed um, about a year ago, two years ago now, um, was the first bromeliad I ever bought about 20 years ago. And it just shows you that if you, if you neglect them and don't pot them and feed them and, um, and sit them in an area where they go into a period of dormancy that they will grow very slowly and uh, will never bloom, um, which is quite uncommon for us, uh, for breezes in New Zealand. Our cold winter temperatures seem to trigger them into blooming quite regularly. But in this case, so this plant didn't bloom. And um, I grew it very slowly and moved it to, to four different properties around Auckland. And um, anyway, it finally bloomed for me last year, but uh, after about almost uh, just over 20 years. And um, yeah, it's uh, quite an interesting story. So um, it, it just shows you that if you, don't, um, if you don't overfeed plants and you want to keep them on ice, if you like, you can actually do it, um, and um, it doesn't happen with everything, but um, certainly some things. Uh, Vriza elata, which is probably going to be part of the Ceparopsis genus uh, in future, um, is also, as I said earlier, is a, another great grower for us here, which is a little bit surprising because it comes from the more tropical zones um, up uh, around um, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela kind of areas, um, but it does very well for us uh, here uh, and grows um, quite quickly and, and blooms quite regularly for us. Breeze of bituminosa, another Brazilian species that's growing, a small one growing in a tree. Whitrockia lepidinum, which is a, supposedly a CV of um, uh, Whitrockia gigantea. Um, is also very common here and is surprisingly not so common in, in some places around the world. Um, it's been around for uh, um, well over a hundred years in cultivation and um, uh, it does bloom for us here. Uh, you have to 
again, have the right conditions for it. It's a bit of a shy bloomer. Sometimes you have to clump it up into a, a large clump for it to bloom regularly, we find. Um, but it does happen. The plant on the right there, as you can see, one that I've grown in a lot more sun. And uh, the, some of you would look at that and think that's perhaps a Neerogelia, but um, it um, is growing in almost full sun. Um, and um, if, you, if you do have the right conditions and climate, you can actually do that and get that nice uh, purple sort of a look to it. With Rockia superba, this is a, a giant form of the species that I've managed to collect from, uh, that came originally from Franz Grumber in Colombia. Uh, th this plant is almost five feet tall, and some of you who grow this species will be used to the much more compact, smaller clone of it. Um, this is a, a giant clone which I had growing in my greenhouse um, and it started to not really enjoy the heat in there I don't think. You can see the burnt uh, leaf tips on it so I, I decided to move it out into the garden. I was just a little bit worried it would, um, wouldn't like winter here but uh, it seems to be doing okay so far. So that's another nice um, clone for us to um, see how it goes. My Neerogelia collection uh, of species, I probably have around 80 of the 125, 130 odd species. Um, and uh, I've moved most of them out of the greenhouse, um, apart from the ones that like the warmer uh, climates and come from places like Pernambuco and Bahia, um, areas uh, of north, northeastern Brazil, but all of the all of the southern Brazilian species, such as Neerogelia rubra vitata here, uh, grow down in the garden and the trees. And you can see here that they, they really thrive. Um, here we have rubra folia in the top left and Ampulacea dark form here, which are just uh, mounted on the trees. And um, they grow as they would in the wild and put out stolons and um, eventually clump up and grow very well. So these plants are getting morning sun on them and they're basically shaded uh, from most of the midday onwards in summertime. Nigellariums. Um, I have about 25 of the 45 odd species, so over half of them. Um, and they are also quite popular here. Uh, Peter Waters has collected a lot of the rarer species over the years from around the world and from from uh, his friend Alton Lemmy in, in Brazil. Um, and they also grow very well for us here as they do in southeastern Brazil. So um, the great thing about them is that um, you can see they a lot of them bloom uh, at the same time and you have color and different, different shapes and colors through right throughout winter time. They'll last for anywhere between three up to nine months uh, in color and bloom and so Again, if you have a cooler, shadier spot to grow your plants, um, I would highly recommend uh, getting grown some uh, Nigellarium species. Similarly, uh, Edmundoa lindini and um, the, the cultivar Brazil, which is the variegated form. Um, I grow these in groups in the, in the shady areas of the garden. These get morning sun on them. Um, and again, they grow very well for us. Um, I've just managed to import the elbow marginated clone, which surprisingly uh, was either lost here or um, uh, was was not here before. Uh, so I'll look forward to adding that to the, the group down there as well. Gasmanias. Um, I remember seeing Gasmania squarosa in one of your talks, I think uh, Jerry's talk that he gave for you um, a few months ago. And um, some of you seem to think it was quite rare or difficult to grow. Um, not so here, it's a very common garden plant here, as is Gasmania variegata, which would also be quite rare in a lot of areas. Um, these come from higher altitudes in, in South America and Central American regions. So um, uh, they're, they're very well suited for us for growing at a lower altitude here, where of course it is much cooler. So any, any plant that comes from higher altitudes um, 
I really like to get my hands on if I can and um, and see how we can grow it. And some of you more learned viewers would have probably realized that by now that some of the plants you've seen so far have come from or do come from higher altitudes and that's why they grow so well. Um, but these are two of my favorites. Um, and um, you know, I have quite a number of them growing in clumps around the garden. And um, yeah, they like with the, the, the earlier uh, plants we've seen, the Gasmania variegata, it, it actually, I had one specimen a year or so ago that bloomed for 10 months. It was um, putting out little white flowers, you see in these fascicles here, uh, from the start of blooming to the end of blooming took 10 months. So um, again, another great plant to have for the garden in a, in a semi-shade spot. Um, another thing I like to do is, as I mentioned, is to research what plants would grow well for us and try and import them. Um, this is a plant that I imported a few years ago from Australia. It used to be known as um, Squarosa Pink, or some of you may still even have it tagged as that because it looks similar to the previous uh, Gasmania squirosa, but um, it is a, a different species in its own right. And um, uh, so I, I got this into the country and then grew it in the garden and it is an absolute rocket ship. Um, it never marks, uh, it grows fast. It, it has uh, many pups after it blooms. And um, I've, now I've managed to share these around and other people are growing them. And um, it has the most wonderful pink uh, coloration. So again, another great plant to get uh, for the garden if you haven't already got it. This is a rarity some of you may not have seen before. Um, this was another one I managed to import that wasn't uh, um, here before. Um, Quisnelia Augusto Cobergi. This is actually the from the type specimen in the Vienna Botanical Gardens that was uh, collected in Brazil over a hundred years ago and um, made its way to Australia and I managed to get hold of it. Um, you can see it's in a pot and I've actually just got it hanging on a wire hanger. Uh, this was in my cooler greenhouse and I decided after it bloomed a couple of times that it, it had to go outside to um, see how it fared. Um, you can see the burnt leaf tips are actually from uh, growing in the greenhouse. Again, I think it's probably had too much sun or too much heat in there. So it's um, doing its thing out in the garden now. So I put it out there and um, about four months later, five months later, I ended up getting eight blooms coming off it. So you can see there's probably 15 plants in that pot and, um, and uh, seven or half of them are blooming. And it has the most wonderful large blue flowers. Unfortunately, they're a bit like Fulberges and most Quisnelias, they don't last very long. Um, but eventually I'll split this uh, pot up and when I get time, uh, that's my biggest problem, getting time. Um, these plants will probably be mounted um, all on these trees here and later on I'll show you how I do that. Um, I also grow a quite a few bilbergias, um, but mainly only species. Um, Bilbergia vitata, we have two or three different clones of that that grows very happily in the trees here. And on the right hand side there, Bilbergia sanderiana. I mentioned earlier uh, where I've cut down the, the trees, um, I leave the logs piled at the base and, and these plants are actually just growing sitting on top of the logs with no soil um, as, they, as they would in the wild. You can see Canistrum alagoanum there. Um, that comes from uh, uh, northeastern Brazil, um, so it likes a warmer climate and it struggled a bit outside. You can see the how the leaves are you getting cold damage on them. So I've had to kind of rescue the pups off that plant and um, and um, grow them up so I can find a better spot for them. So these are the little challenges we kind of face throughout the year. This is a giant uh, plant um, which has a little bit of a an, an unknown uh, history for us. The, it's probably Echnia floribunda. Some of the Brazilians will recognize this, but um, the bloom seems to be a little bit closer to some Hohenberges. I think I saw this plant in Dan Canard's uh, garden when I was there at your conference in, in 2018. Um, gets, gets huge, this is nearly two meters diameter and um, 
probably the biggest plant I have in the garden at the moment. Um, but I'm looking forward to blooming that and trying to find out exactly what it is. There's a few arguments in Australia about what actually is it is or whether it's a hybrid, but the necrotic tips on there look very much like uh, what you would get on Ecmea floribunda, but we'll see. Hi, uh, Ecmea nudicaulis. Um, this is a large uh, log and a big stump that I have in one part of the garden, which I, I grow all most of the nudicaulis together. Um, the, there are some mounted on other trees, but um, I like to keep them all together. So when they bloom in summertime, they, um, they, they look nice. Um, so I probably have probably about 35 different clones I've collected over the years of, of different types of nudicaulis, some variegated clones, but um, we've had a lot of uh, different clones here for many years. Um, Muriel Waterman was our first bromeliad pioneer in the 1950s, so she got a lot of plants uh, in the post from Mulford Foster and, and uh, other people around the world, and um, so we've had a lot of these um, hardier clones growing here for many, many years. The one on the right there is a, a beautiful pink banded clone that was collected in Brazil and taken to Selby Gardens. Um, had a Selby number on it that we've uh, given a cultivar name now uh, from where it was collected in Parana in Brazil. Um, Ecmea gigantea is another one you don't see all too often. Um, we don't grow Ecmea blanchettiana very well here. Uh, we, we, we can, I do grow it in the garden in two or three different forms, but um, it grows slowly and um, you have to have the right position for it. Whereas Ecmea gigantea is a similar looking plant and also gets the lovely orange uh, yellow sort of coloration and um, it grows uh, much, quite a lot better for us. Um, it's a little bit more cold hardy than blanchettiana. Uh, so you will see that used um, in, in garden landscapes here. Ecmea spectabilis. So here's just some adaptations that we see when we're mounting plants or growing them in the garden. Uh, as you can see, the left-hand photo there, um, I put this, this quite large uh, pup on top of a, a tree fern stump down in the the bottom pond area of the garden and uh, one of the local birds decided it would be a great place to start a family. Um, so that's about four or five feet off the ground there um, coming up above the pond and um, the plant suffered a little bit um, for a while and um, unfortunately the, the nest ended up being blown away or some uh, critters ended up taking the eggs. Um, but um, that's the same plant on the right hand side there. You can see after about uh, three years, it's um, managed to fill out and um, grow a lot better. And is perfectly happy growing just with no soil on top of that stump. This is another thing that I've learned um, over the years of growing species in the trees. Now, Ecnea purpurea rosea um, is a a reasonably rare species again in some areas. Um, uh, you don't see it often here, um, but that's because um, a lot of people grow it in pots as they would normally grow their plants or in the garden, and it doesn't like cold, wet conditions. So if you have it in a pot in the garden, as I did uh, many years ago, it tends to die back very easily and rot and doesn't do very well. So what I decided to do was, was take it out of its pot and put it onto a tree here. It gets morning sun virtually all year round. And um, once I did that, it started to grow a lot better. And that's because it's, that's how it grows in the wild. It's an epiphyte. Um, it's not getting wet feet. It's not getting cold. It's getting morning sun on it in winter time to warm it up. And it started to grow a lot better. You can see this plant here, which is the original one of the original pups is starting to look a bit worse for wear. It bloomed, and then of course it's gonna die off. But the pups that have come off it are pretty much unmarked and are looking very nice. Um, and then this photo on the right, I actually only photographed about three weeks ago in full bloom, a lovely strong flower, and, um, and it's looking very good. So that's just another technique you can think about. If you're having problems with, uh, you probably don't have a lot of cold issues in, in San Diego, but 
Um, if you do and plants are suffering, maybe think about where they're growing and maybe take them off the ground where they, they um, are a bit happier. Um, this is another one that uh, is quite a rare species, it used to be Echmea tentaculifera, um, has a lovely um, tentacle-like uh, inflorescence, hence the name, with beautiful little white flowers. So this is one that um, I've always grown in the greenhouse, in a warmer environment. Um, uh, it can be grown in full sun, has lovely wide leaves and black tips, and will go quite yellowy, um, whitish color leaf. Um, so I decided to put that down on the garden on top of some logs and um, it's growing fine and has adapted well to its new new home and then rewarded me with the flower. It never actually bloomed inside. So again, you can put something outside and um, quite often it will adapt itself and then start to bloom more regularly. As I had with Ecmea's disjuncta, these, I think this is probably the first plant that's ever been grown outside in New Zealand. Again, they've been very rare here over the years and people have probably lost them. Um, this is the unbanded larger clone of it. Um, I have about three or four different uh, clones of it. Um, but again, I mounted that on a tree and um, it did bloom for me indoors, but um, mounting it on a tree, you can see it's had a puff down here and um, is, is, is flowered after a year or so. Ecmea, oh, sorry, Alcantaria geniculata, um, very popular here and a few different clones and grows very well and as does Imperialis and uh, Glazuana are the three, and Vinicolor are probably the four most popular species we grow. Uh, some of the other, uh, species such as ex some of the clones of Extensa and Odorata don't do so well here. Uh, you have to again watch where and how you're growing them. Here's just a shot of um, the, uh, the Alcantarias in the garden there. There are some neo hybrids up here on the top side of the wall. So um, um, that's how I grow them. Some of these are in the ground. Uh, some of them are in pots, so I can move them around once they once they get too large for their little spot. Hohenberges, um, uh, as I said a bit earlier, difficult to grow here. There are not a lot of species, and some of them are quite rare. Um, for example, Hohenberges stellata has uh, probably been here many, many years ago, but has been lost over the years because people haven't known how to grow it properly. So we end up losing them and we have to re-import them again. This lovely large red form I got in a few years ago and is one of my favorites. Um, and home veg of Bill Marxi um, has been grown from seed a few times. This is a darker form of the species. Um, that tends to grow okay outside, but a lot of the other species such as Vestita and Pinai and Ho uh, Leopoldo Horsti, we struggle to grow them outside. Um, uh, we can grow Coria Raujoy outside, but again, you have to have the right kind of conditions for it to do well, otherwise you'll get a lot of bad leaf dieback on it. We do grow things like this very well though, um, Fasicularia bicolor and Ocagavias. Um, these uh, are perhaps very rare and you wouldn't see blooms in a lot of your warmer areas because they come from the coasts around Chile and um, like to be grown in a cooler environment. Um, but they basically grow like weeds here. They clump up very fast. Um, one of our, um, our public gardens, uh, Eden Glade, which is our society maintained garden in Auckland City, has huge clumps of this and you can go there at certain times of the year and see all of these Ocagavias in bloom. Um, so, um, Again, something, something to grow if you have a cooler environment. And you've probably been wondering about Talansias. Um, we do have um, extensive collections of Talansias in New Zealand, but many of them are, have to be grown uh, in protective environments indoors or in greenhouses because, again, as I said earlier, a lot of them don't like to be cool, cool and wet in wintertime. There are some, however, such as these two that do grow well outside. There are 
uh, quite a number of the green leaf varieties that we can grow in trees um, and uh, in the gardens without any, any issue. And Tillandsia burgery um, grows into huge clumps. We have uh, three or four different forms of it here um, and um, very, very popular in the gardens here. And as you would have seen in my first photo of the day, um, I've managed to grow Tillandsia azii um, very well in, in the garden and I've bloomed it uh, twice in the last few years. Um, we had uh, one of our members grow some from seed um, probably about 12 years ago and, um, and they grow very well. If you put them down in the shady area of the garden, either you can see that one as a potted plant there that I've just hung up uh, in the tree to, so the bloom can hang down. Um, I found putting it down in the shady area of the garden, uh, just where it could catch the, the, the natural uh, leaf detritus, um, it grew very quickly from maybe a, a, a 30 centimeter plant to a, a 60 to 70 centimeter plant in about two, two or three years. And uh, then it bloomed. Um, similarly, the next plant I had, um, I decided, okay, that's great. Let's put that down there as well. And uh, two years later, uh, this plant on the, on the right here did the same thing. So they love our climate and um, it's just a shame that they don't give pups after blooming. And myself and John Mitchell, who you see here, had a competition to see who could grow the longest um, bloom on our, on our plants. And he beat me by a few centimeters. So um, never mind. Um, we tried feverishly to make seed on them, uh, also crossing them with another clone that we, or another plant that we had in bloom here at another member's place. But unfortunately, this, most of the seed uh, seems to be uh, unviable, which you can get from trying to cross the same clones. Um, uh, there hopefully are some hybrids that we've made that, that are going to germinate, but um, that's still a work in progress for us. Uh, okay, so we'll just move on to finish the talk with some um, uh, techniques and tips that I've learned um, or use for growing growing species as epiphytes. And as you would have gleaned, I like to do that and experiment with the best ways of doing that. So over the years, I've I've come to to sort of hone down on um, a few tools and tricks to actually do this the best. You can see some yuccas um, here that were again probably the only one of the only non-natives I had in the garden. So I decided they were blocking out light and they and they were actually blocking the view from the house of the garden. So I chopped them off and then I decided I'd mount my my carcarodons on top of these. And uh, you'll see a bit later on how I do that. But firstly, let's look at at what I actually use. Um, many of us would have used things such as old stockings or um, ribbing material or wire to actually tie plants onto trees. But what I found was, was that over time, they tend to either stretch or rot or um, the plants move in, the, in these mounts and they, they end up uh, falling over or getting blown down. So what I, did, what I started using was selection of nails and these two fence staples here, which are used by, by fences to, to attach, attach wire to farm fences, basically. You can buy this use in the hardware store in packs of large packs. So I use two sizes, a large one and a small one. And um, as you'll see, they, they fit over the stolons um, and then the bases of, of many plants very well. The other tool I've started using is the, is the zip tie. And you can see this one here is a very large one. It's about, it's about 550 millimeters long um, or almost two feet long. Um, my company actually sells these in bulk packages. So I'm lucky to get lots of different sizes of these and, and um, at a cheap price. But you can also buy these from automotive stores or hardware stores. Um, and um, they're very good for holding plants onto trees and branches, as we will see. So firstly, just some different methods. And as I mentioned, this, this um, 
stretched uh, ribbed material was something I started using. You might remember the Visa Guitata from earlier. So this is how I mounted it onto, onto a branch. And this is quite good because you can actually wrap the root ball of the plant completely several times and then strap it onto a branch um, or a, a perch as this one has here. And it does do the job quite well, but again, it will actually rot over time and um, unless the plant roots very well, um, it can become unstable. But this method, I, I do use this method for particularly for mounting some plants where branches are horizontal uh, because you can wrap both sides of the mount and the root ball um, and stabilize it, even if you are using such things as staples and nails. It also gives the roots um, a little bit of uh, protection and um, hydration, keeping them moist. But um, um, I don't have a lot of horizontal branches in my garden, so I don't actually uh, use this method very much anymore. Um, the other method, as I said, is, is the, the nail or uh, the plastic coated wire or wire method. You can see here a uh, Gasmania squirosa, which I've mounted onto a, onto a kneecap palm. And, um, this was a, a, a smallish pup that I decided I'd put onto a side of a tree one day. So after I cut it off the mother, I simply put a large nail through the, through the, the, root, the root mass down here, um, making sure that you don't go through the merry stem or the growing area of the plant. So it just goes through the root mass of the plant, which is quite stiff and hard into the tree. And that's not really going to hold the plant very stable, especially in high winds. So what I did was I wrapped uh, a piece of wire, plastic coated wire around the, the, the plant. The tree was too, too large to wrap a, a zip tie around it. Um, so putting a piece of wire around it just gives it that added stability and makes sure that the plant doesn't move. So what you want to do is have the heel of the plant where the roots are going to come out must be adjacent to the tree um, so the, the new roots can actually uh, find its host and, and start to glue onto there. So underneath here, you can see that there are actually uh, new roots that have attached themselves to the tree and the plant is actually quite stable. So when the pups come out from the top here, they'll be a lot more uh, stable and then they will, will probably start to put roots down as well. So here's a good example here of using the, the pinch method of the, of the staple. So a lot of the, when you get stolons off the plants, a lot of them will be curved or they'll have a special shape to them. I'm sure many of you have done this. Um, finding the right size and position on a tree or a little knob such as this one here where you can, where you can position the, the plant above it. And um, again, making sure that this area, the heel of the plant, not the dead, not so much this dead end of the stolen, which is uh, hard and woody and won't put roots out, but the plant will put roots out from this region here. So as long as that is touching the tree and is not going to move, very quickly the plant will start to root. So that's just one single, single staple that holds the plant, plant firm. It doesn't matter if, if the staples damage the stolen in any way, um, it won't harm the plant. And contrary to what you might read, zinc coated staples uh, I have found do not, do not um, harm the plants in any way. Same with nails. You can nail, put a nail if you also need to straight through the middle of that, of that stolen up here somewhere, just to give it added stability if it's a larger plant. And um, the nail will not hurt the plant. Uh, here's, here's an example of the larger Staples. So depending on the, the diameter of the stolen determines obviously which size staple you would use. And you can see that's just simply being stapled there. You can see one of our friendly German wasps has decided to come and watch what I'm doing. And, um, and the plant uh, after a few months has started to put out its roots from its heel. And now that is completely firmly rooted into the tree. If I wanted to, I could take that staple away. And you can see how it's starting to put another pup, another pup module coming here, and it's perfectly happy. 
So here's just some examples of, of using them on paper bark trees. So you would have noticed those large Kanuka natives uh, actually have long, long strips of paper bark. So they're not very conducive to, to mounting plants on in the, in the usual sense. Um, so what I do is I try to mount stoloniferous plants on them because they don't generally put out anchor roots onto the trees as long as you have a stable base for the plant. And occasionally you may have to reposition the clump or cut off pups and re-nail them on. Um, you, can, you can quite easily do it. So you can see a staple holding the stolons here uh, right in here, you can see another one that is actually holding the root mass firmly onto the tree and so the plant can easily clump up. So here's the, the, the zip tie message. Talantia yunkeri is a, another beautiful species that um, comes from, again, a higher altitude and around the Central American, lower Mexico region. Um, this is a plant that I grew for one of our displays one year. Very large, got it to a very large size and large inflorescence. And this one gave me um, five or six and very nice pups eventually. And so what I decided to do was, was use them by tying them to the trees. So you can see the right hand picture there. I've left the cable ties on there to show you how this tree is probably about two or three inches in diameter, a very thin uh, cabbage tree or cordyline tree, which has very nice firm bark for roots to uh, easily attach to. And they are simply cable tied with the base hard up against the, the, the tree again. Um, and you can see after about six to eight weeks, they're starting to put roots out. Interestingly, the one on the left here has put roots out both sides of the heel. We have some that are already glued to the tree on this side. And uh, these roots, I'm not sure where they're going, but you can see over here, the ones that have come out the other side of the plant um, are starting to turn back towards the host tree. So um, within um, maybe another, another month, two months, um, that plant, those ties, sorry, can be cut off and uh, the plant will be um, uh, perfectly anchored to it. Here's another example of just using nails and um, the zip ties together. You can see there, the, these go back to my carcaridons I sh showed earlier. So that through the bottom of the heel, we have a nail. And then also around the heel of the plant is the, is the zip tie, which is then anchored on the back with another nail to stop the zip tie from, from riding up and coming off the, the top of the mount. So that is very, very firm. Um, it won't move in very, even very high wind. And the great thing about the zip ties is you can really um, get used to the tension you need uh, just by clicking them up until you get that right tension by feeling the plant uh, without making it too tight. So they're, they're very good to use like that. And um, this photo I, I included because it's very interesting. It shows you, um, the amazing nature of bromeliad roots. Now these, these, these pups of the Scotex tiger rooted on these yuccas, after about um, three months, they were um, put out a huge amount of roots. Um, you can even see another, uh, a, um, a new pup of the, of, a, of the yucca sprouting through the middle of the roots there. But after a few months, I, you can see I've cut the cable tie off and you can see up here how the, the malleable nature of the roots, how they are, are basically liquid. They have filled out the, the zip indentations of the tie and actually grown right into the tie here. And so that just shows you that when they come out of the plant, they are actually like liquid glue. And um, they will take on any shape and form to attach themselves to their hosts. So they're really quite amazing. Um, you'll see in the next slide too, a couple of next slides are some other um, incredible things that they can do. But here's just um, an idea of the, of the success you can get. So this is uh, Talancia dipiana, um, growing perfectly naturally now on a tree, obviously with my help. But um, uh, so this was cable tied on. You can see where the cable tie was, was around this uh, section of the, where the roots have came out of the pup here. Um, 
and um, after about 10 weeks, this thing just glued itself to the tree. You can see the, the huge amount of roots it's put out in all directions. So once it was firmly uh, mounted, simply cut the tie away and then it looks like it's um, growing completely naturally. And that's what I try to achieve. Um, and as the, gr the great thing about using the zip ties, you, you can just, they take about 10 seconds to put on and they take about three seconds to take off. So just to finish, uh, here's, here's something else amazing that um, I'll just quickly show you. This is Quesnelia arvensis, which uh, grows as a terrestrial sometimes in the wild, but also as an epiphyte. Uh, again, very common here um, in gardens. And um, I had this mounted about four meters up one of the large paperbark trees. And you can see that occasionally storms, um, when these clumps get larger, they will blow them down as they do in the wild. And they end up recolonizing from the bases of the trees uh, or lower branches. And um, you can see here that, that this was probably originally nailed onto a tree or maybe just shoved into a, um, a, a branch um, um, crook up, high up in the, in the canopy. And you can see the piece of the paper bark here has, has actually torn right away from the, from the plant. And um, what happens is the, the bromeliads try to end up, even though they, it's not a firm anchor point, they do actually try rooting to the paper bark. Um, this photo here shows you how this paper bark is, is about six millimeters thick and the roots have actually grown right through the bark. You can see them coming through. Here's the, here's the plant over here, and its heel is on the, on the other side of the bark here, and the roots have actually grown right through the bark, about six millimeters, um, trying to find a more firm anchor point. And um, I was quite, a, it's the first time I've seen that, um, and was just lucky to notice that when this uh, clump had blown off, off the tree. But um, just again, shows you the amazing nature of bromeliad roots and what you can learn by growing them like this. So that's the end of my talk. I hope you uh, in, enjoyed it and maybe learned something. Um, just, uh, just to finish um, my little um, advertisement um, plug, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are having our Australasian bromeliad conference in, in Auckland, um, which is scheduled for April next year uh, at this stage, um, COVID pending. Um, if not, it will be postponed, but um, um, if, you, if you are thinking of coming down to maybe having a look at um, how we grow things and enjoying our Kiwi gardens, please, please do so. Everybody is welcome and you can find all the information there on our society website with registration and, and the program for the conference. So that's all I have. Um, I won't take up any more time, but happy to take um, any questions if you have them. Graham, I guess I do have a question. Sure. Um, for the conference, um, is there going to be a way for people to um, get their plants inspected and be able to do some, you know, exporting? Uh, yes, I'm hoping so. Um, we do have quite stringent um, import and export rules here, as you would as you would know firsthand, Scott. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but yes, um, I am going to be researching that and, um, and hopefully having um, places where maybe at my own, my own property and also another one or two members where we can dip, or you can dip plants and clean plants after the conference and then get them expect, inspected for your, for your phytos. Um, it's a little bit different to some of the conferences where you have in in the United States where your inspector will actually come to the conference. Um, I believe they won't actually do that in New Zealand or Australia, but um, I am going to be asking them if they will. <laughs> um, but if they won't, I'll certainly have information available for those of you who do want to buy plants and, and export. We will be having a lot of our new New Zealand hybrids for sale um, and a, lo a lot of plants that you wouldn't have seen before. So. If you are thinking about it, um, certainly, um, yeah, I'll be in touch with you after you register and, um, yeah, we can make, try and make it happen.
they're worth it. Nancy, I think you had a question, huh? Yeah, I, um, I just wanted to ask a quick question about um, the Ochagavia. Did you say it grows better in a cooler area? Yes. M mine did clump and it has bloomed hmm, maybe three, four years ago. One of them bloomed, but it's clumped, but it hasn't bloomed since. And I don't, maybe it needs to be cooler. <laughs> Yeah, they, they can be um, a little bit shy to bloom, I've found, um, but they, they, they do seem to bloom a lot better once they're clumped, um, like most of those um, uh, Chilean um, lithophyte kind of species, they, they do like to be in large clumps and then you'll get regular blooms on them. Um, but yeah, I think we do find that if you do have a colder a colder snap in winter time, like you like you do get in San Diego, you, you probably will 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 get it blooming. Um, yeah, I, I think I I'm not sure, but there was a plant in the uh, Paradise Point Gardens that I thought was the fascicularia bicolor. Um, in fact, I showed it to Jose Manzanares when he was there, and I think he grabbed one and took it back to with him to Ecuador um, because he had never he, he didn't have it or he had never seen it. But um, it certainly looked like it, but it wasn't in flower, so I couldn't tell for sure. But um, it's definitely looked like it. So maybe go and check it out one day if you're down that there and, and see if they're flowering. Have Are there any other questions? Yes. Um, have your techniques, Graham, which I admire immensely, um, been used widely in the North Island? Um, Yes, I think um, I think a lot more people are getting creative with with trying to to grow plants as as epiphytes. Um, you, I mentioned the tree ferns earlier, which uh, we yeah. call our our native punna tree is the is the Maori name for them. Uh, so we have quite a few different um, species and varieties of them here. Um, you can actually buy the bare logs in our garden centres. Um, uh, to, to use in your in your garden, so a lot of people are buying them. They are reasonably expensive, but you can buy them, and, you, and they're very good for mounting bromeliads on. Simply well, by they'd be, they'd be perfect even for, just for that. Them in your, yeah, and um, yeah. and they will root to the to the tree fern fiber. Um, so a lot of people are doing that, but yeah, I think um, the cable tie method is probably more of a new thing. Um, and people that come to visit me are, are starting to get ideas and use that. So that's kind of why I wanted to share that today to, you know, they're available all around the world and there's just such an easy, easy method of doing it. Um, and um, as, as I say, allows you to make a more natural look, look uh, later on. Sure. Any other questions? Um, yes, I'm wondering what kind of wildlife you get in your garden besides the birds. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, New, New Zealand's very lucky. Uh, we don't have any snakes. Um, we don't have any large mammals that come through, apart from wild pigs that you do get in some of our native Whoa. forests, but but not in not in the city areas where I am. We do have possums. Uh, they can be a little bit of an issue, uh, eating a lot of the native fauna. Uh, and, and sorry. Yeah, um, flora I should say um, um, but no we don't get a lot of um, uh, major pests that do a lot of damage to the plants mm. um, uh, it's um, there's a few rats and things like that that can can eat a few berries but um, yeah it's not really a problem for us the birds uh, where I live we get a lot of large native wood pigeons <coughs> come here basically daily to drink out of the guttering and um, uh, and also the native tuis that you saw, they, they breed down in the valley and um, are here all day, every day. Beautiful yeah, snow. Snow, snow, snow. And, um, yeah, there's not too much else happening, happening other than those. Any other questions? Yeah, so what was the bug you had? What is the pest bug that you showed? Well, as I said, that's that's our native wetter, which is a what kind of kind of you could Witter? think of it as a as a large grasshopper come cricket kind of a beast. Um, 
but yeah, it it loves living in our in our native bush, specifically the kind of of bush that I have with the with the large kanuka and manuka trees. Um, it, it really likes that habitat. Some species live in caves uh, and can get much larger, up to five inches long. They can grow. Um, so the they are beastly looking things, but they're, they're quite harmless uh, unless you try and attack them. They'll, they, will, they will attack you and give you a bit of a nip. But um, yeah, unfortunately, they do like eating particularly breezes and tillandsias. Um, and um, the, the other problem we have basically is snails. Um, oh, wow. We do get a lot of snails and slugs in our gardens. Um, they love eating uh, younger Alcantaria uh, in particular. And um, we have to, I have to be careful with, um, you, you know, using slug pellets around some pots and things, and otherwise it can be quite unsightly, the damage you can get. But um, yeah, the, the wetters, as I say, are a bit of a nightmare. They, I'm sure there's three or four of them that sit and look at my greenhouse and eat, decide which great plants they're going to have a chew on. <laughs> um, but uh, that comes with the territory, I guess. Okay, we have time Graham? for about one more question. Graham, I see somebody has also asked a question, uh, George. Do you have to water as well or do you rely on, on rainwater only? Do um, you have a dry time when you need to yes, water? Yes, good question. I didn't really mention that. Um, uh, no, I in the in the garden you saw with the photos I saw, I basically don't, don't ever have to water. Um, I think I have once or twice when it's been very hot for very long periods, but in summertime here, um, we do get um, uh, cooling showers uh, reasonably regularly. Um, so the plants that grow in trees, as you can see, most of them are in a, a shade, shadier kind of area uh, and they will hold the water quite well. Um, but there are some such as the, some of the Tillandsias and, um, the, the plants that are growing on the full sun trees, I might give the odd, the odd squirt from the hose occasionally, um, but that's very, very, um, not very often. Maybe once or twice in the middle of summer, I have to do that, and that's only if I really think about it or have the time. Um, the, uh, the the rest of the garden is fairly well self-sufficient. And by hot, do you mean what, 27 degrees Celsius or 80 degrees Fahrenheit? Or does it even get that hot? That would be the hottest we would get in summertime. Yep, yep. Um, typically, you're looking around 25, uh, which you know is is really good temperature for growing most most bromeliads. Yeah. But I mean, you, you can get the odd day. You might get a 30, but it's it's like for one day. It doesn't last for a week or two weeks, or which is what you, a lot of you folks get, and that can really do the damage. So you might get the odd hot day of 30, 32 maybe, but uh, you know it's not really a problem for us. And, the, and you might get the odd leaf scorch happening if you have the wrong, the wrong plant in the wrong area, but you know, hey, it's, uh, it's not as if our whole gardens are getting decimated in, you know, in three hours kind of thing. Um, so yeah, but I am lucky having the trees around here. They, they act as a bit of a, you know, they do cool the, the, the plants and, and act as a windbreak and when it's high wind and, and also keep the temperature down a little bit when it's very hot. Graeme, you've talked about temperatures. How, are, how is the humidity um, generally? Does it vary during the day or during the season? Uh, yeah, it can, it can get humid sometimes here, particularly um, around the, the late the late spring, early summer areas, um, well, probably all the way through summer, you, we can get quite a few humid days um, where it is a bit sticky and, and tropical feeling. Um, it depends really how much wind we have kind of have. Um, but um, being in such a narrow area between the two sort of oceans here, we, we do tend to get um, a cooling breeze and um, but it can bring quite a few humid showers. So again, the plants seem to enjoy it. Um, the ones growing outside and in the greenhouse, they do enjoy it um, and they don't 
they don't dry out as you would, a lot of you folks would experience where you don't get that humidity. Um, so we don't get a lot of leaf curling and that kind of thing happening with the plants growing outside, which is, which is nice, you know. Um, you know, on the other side of the coin, we have to deal with the cold damage and um, those kind of issues. But um, yeah, a little bit of humidity, but not as bad as, as what, what some, some folks would get. Thank you so much, Marine, for your presentation, very much. Graham, thank, thank you. you so very much for your presentation. The plants were just amazing, uh, the way that they grow in New Zealand and especially the Rishas. Um, and we really appreciate your getting up in the middle of the night to give us <laughs> your program. So thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, I probably talked a bit longer than I was allowed to, but um, oh, it's great. I hope you, no problem. hope you enjoyed it. We really yes. enjoyed Fantastic. it. Fantastic. Great.